Ladies and gentlemen, federal employees, welcome to this episode. And today is a Q&A episode here on the YouTube channel and podcast. My name is Dallin Haas, uh, a financial planner serving you guys as federal employees, helping you guys retire comfortable and confident. Today, I'm going to be answering four questions. I know, we're feeling good. Four questions today about your benefits and your retirement. So we're going to dive right in. If you're new here, definitely consider joining the community. It is a great group of people really trying to get the most out of their careers and retirement. And we talk about this all the time. So we're going to dive right in and go to question number one. This federal employee, they ask, they say, I have maxed out my contributions to my TSP and a Roth IRA, and I am blessed to have money left over. Where should I be putting that money so that it continues to work for me? Okay, so this is a great question, and I totally understand that not everyone is gonna be in that situation, right? Not everyone is going to be able to max out their TSP and max out a Roth IRA, right? It really depends on your situation, and do the very best that you can. But if you do find yourself in that situation where you say, hey, I've maxed out my TSP, I've maxed out a Roth IRA, the first place I'd look is, okay, um, if you're married, uh, what, what about your spouse? Is your spouse working? Do they have a 401k? Do they have a Roth IRA? Can you, you know, is there anything else you guys can do on that front, right? Obviously, that's a big deal. Second, look at debts. Do you have any debts? I assume if you're asking this question, you don't, but look at your mortgage. What's your plan to get your mortgage paid off by retirement? You want to certainly look at all those things as well, okay? If all those boxes are checked, the next place to go is a brokerage account. Right? And a brokerage account is just a regular investment account and it is not a retirement account. So it doesn't have all the normal tax advantages that retirement accounts have. Now, it does have a lot more flexibility. So there is some big advantages of at least having some money in a brokerage account come retirement. It gives you some flexibility when it comes to when you can take money out and the different tax strategies that you can use to really try to minimize taxes as best you can. So, and let me give you an, an idea of what the tax situation does look like in a brokerage account. So if we look at something like your TSP, an IRA, normal retirement accounts, the only time you have to worry about taxes is when you pull the money out, right? That's the time that you have to worry and think about the tax impacts of your decisions. But with a brokerage account, it's a little different. It's actually every single year. For example, in the year that you earn, let's say, dividends or interest, then that is when you're gonna have to pay taxes on those things. Or when you sell an investment for a gain, then you would have to, to pay taxes as well. But if you hold that investment for longer than a year, you can pay what they call long-term capital gains taxes. And the biggest thing you need to know is that generally long-term care, or long, not long-term care, long-term capital gains taxes are lower than your normal taxes you pay when taking money out of the TSP. So there's some room for some tax strategies, just manipulating, okay, where do we take money? What tax rates do we wanna pay? And what makes sense in each year that you need money in retirement? All right, but those are the things you really should be thinking about when you have some extra money and deciding where to put it. But we're gonna move right along to question Number two, and this federal employee, they ask, I will have several sources of income when I and my, when my wife and I retire in 2022. It's 2022, so congrats, it's coming, I'm sure coming, um, coming right up. They continue on, they say, there is a military pension, military, military disability, social security, and my FERS pension. And my wife will have social security and a FERS pension as well. And when I look at our monthly net income before and after retirement, there is only a $700 deficient before even withdrawing money from the TSP. Given this, how should we be investing in our TSP? This is a great, great, great question. And I really like how this federal employee, they understand what kind of factors go into deciding how you should be investing your TSP. Because honestly, especially when you're close to retirement, there's really no one size fits all. When people are starting their career and they got 30, 40 years before they are gonna retire and gonna be needing money from their TSP, well, it gets a little simpler, right? You wanna be aggressive and that's basically it, right? But as you approach retirement, it really depends on when and how much money you're gonna need every year, right? So the structure that we use, and there's lots of different ways to structure in retirement, but you have to find one that makes sense for you and works for you and you can execute consistently in retirement. The structure we use is called a bucket strategy, where we set up different buckets of money for different time periods in retirement. For example, uh, the strategy we use 
is the first three years of money that you're gonna be needing from your TSP, we're gonna put that into something super safe like the G Fund, right? So let's say this person needs $700 a month. Okay, great, $700 times 12, that's how much money they're gonna need for one year times three for three years, okay? And of course you wanna look at taxes, it's okay. Do you need $700 before taxes or after taxes? Maybe they actually need $900 or $1,000 a month and then they pay taxes and then they use whatever's left, right? You kinda of have to look at that. But that's kind of the first bucket we set up is that we call it the cash bucket. Put it into something like the, like the G Fund where it's, it's not gonna grow much, that's for sure, but it's gonna be safe for you and you're gonna be able to use that in the first three years of retirement, right? Um, next, the next bucket is the um, next three years of money that you're gonna need after the first three, right? And so do the math, on, okay, how much are you planning to use? Let's lock that up into something like the F Fund where it's not gonna grow much again, but it's gonna be relatively safe. And so as a whole, you got about six years in a G fund and the F fund, and it doesn't have to be the G fund or the F fund. It has to be comparable funds-ish um, to get you kind of that safety net that, that we're looking for. Um, and so you got about six years worth of money that is safe, ready to go. So that allows you for the rest of your money to be more aggressive say, hey, even if the market crashes on the day you retire, well, you got six years worth of conservative money to live off of and you could let your more aggressive money recover so you don't have to sell when it's down. That is the biggest benefit of this strategy to give you the buffer so when the market's down, you don't have to sell your investments when it's down. So that's the strategy we use in our firm. Again, you could, if you just Google you know, strategies about um, how to invest in retirement, there's thousands and thousands of different ideas. You have to find one that makes sense for you and that you can execute consistently over time in retirement. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'll put a link below. I, I've done a number of videos and articles on this exact topic of how we kind of structure this, so feel free to check that out if you have more questions there. All right, question number three. They say, can any portion of my TSP holdings be rolled into an external IRA prior to my MRA or their minimum retirement age while employed? Okay, there's a lot of things in that short sentence, there's a lot of things kind of built in. But basically what they're asking is, hey, I'm still employed. I'm under my minimum retirement age. So for most of you, that's between 56 and 57. So they're under that age, right? They're still employed and they'd like to roll over some of their TSP into an IRA. And the short answer to this question is there's really not any ways to do it. Um, really not. There's, there's three main ways to get money out of your TSP while you're still employed, okay? First, this is a TSP loan, right? I'm not a huge fan of them, but they can be helpful sometimes in some circumstances, okay? But you certainly cannot roll that into a IRA. That, that doesn't work there, right? Next, there is a financial hardship in-service withdrawal. Basically, um, if you qualify, there's a number of rules. If you just Google you know, financial hardship TSP in-service withdrawal, um, you'll find a bunch of information on it. But basically, if you do have some sort of financial hardship, you are eligible to take money out of your TSP even before 59 and a half, but taxes will come into play if you're taking from the traditional TSP and potentially 10% penalty if you're under 59 and a half. But sometimes um, that's what people do, sometimes. I, I certainly don't recommend it. Obviously, you should have an emergency fund, you should have things in place, so you never have to do that, but that is an option. But again, you can't roll that into an IRA. You can't do that. Um, the last one, is an age-based in-service withdrawal. And basically what this says is, hey, if you're over 59 and a half, then you actually can take money out of your TSP. And in that case, you actually could roll it to an IRA, but to be eligible for an age-based withdrawal, you have to be over 59 and a half. So for this federal employee's question, the answer is real, no, there's not really any way. While you're still employed um, under 59 and a half, and especially under your minimum retirement age, there's not really a way um, to do that cleanly. I would just keep it simple. I keep money in your TSP until you retire and then decide how you want to manage it from then on out. So those are my thoughts there. All right, question number four. They say, is there any advantage to having FEHB, Medicare, and TRICARE for life in retirement? I'm eligible for TRICARE at age 60. So do I keep FEHB and enroll in TRICARE but then end FEHB at 65 and I'm eligible for Medicare? Or do I keep all three? Great question. So this is really gonna apply to you folks that are um, have military time 
or reserve this time and you're gonna be eligible for TRICARE maybe right now or in the future, right? And the question for him is, hey, I'm eligible for FEHB, right, under FERS. I'm eligible for TRICARE. And at 65, Medicare is going to come into play. So that's three different programs. And how in the world should he structure this in a way that makes sense for him, right? It's a great question. There's no one-size-fits-all. So there's a couple of things to think about, though. First, for TRICARE, some people love TRICARE. Um, even during their career, they don't even take FEHB. They like TRICARE. They're okay with sometimes the limited amount of services and maybe having to go to the VA, whatever. They're okay with that. They're totally cool with that. And so it works great for them. And they, they're able to save some money, right? Some people do not like just TRICARE. Some people certainly want the FEHB as well because they like the option to go to other providers, right? So that's kind of one big question is when you turn 60, and you're eligible for TRICARE and FEHB, you wanna decide, okay, what providers and what kind of service do I want? Some people are just fine with just TRICARE, right? But again, it's kind of a personal decision. And of course, cost is an issue, um, but also kind of what providers you think you're gonna need and things like that. Okay, but now when you turn 65, what, what happens? Well, if you are on TRICARE for life, you are required to be on Medicare Part B, right? And Medicare Part B cost money. There's a premium there. so. The question for you is, you know, the question that you ask is, hey, do I drop FEHB at that point and just have Medicare and TRICARE for life or do I keep FEHB as well? And, you know, as you know, keeping all three is the most expensive option, right? Because you have to, of course, pay for Medicare Part B and then FEHB as well. So um, ideally, you don't have to do that, but um, you, you certainly can. I, I've heard of some people doing that, but I, I think it probably is overkill. But again, you'd have to be comfortable with just TRICARE and Medicare. Um, and there are certain rules on, of course, what TRICARE is going to cover and what Medicare is going to cover. And if you have a particular service or need that TRICARE and Medicare covers, well, it's not going to cost you anything out of pocket. So for you, I would really dig into, okay, what kind of services do you think you're going to need? Um, in retirement, what kind of services does TRICARE cover, Medicare cover? And from there, you could really make some educated decisions, uh, but it gets really nuanced depending on what you need. But ideally, yeah, you wanna keep it simple, and many, many, many people are very happy with just TRICARE and Medicare. So you certainly don't need FEHB, it's just a matter of your you know, personal decision, how you wanna structure things, what providers you want, and, and stuff like that. So I hope, I hope that was helpful. Those are the four questions for today. Again, if you have any questions yourself, there's a link below to submit that. And also below, there is the 2022 TSP cheat sheet that we produce for you guys, because we know the TSP has so much information written about it, whether on the tsp.gov website, just across the internet. And we want to summarize the key facts of 2022, um, you know, in 2022, about the TSP. So there's a link below to get that cheat sheet as well. So if you have any questions yourself, again, there's a link below to submit those. I hope you have an incredible rest of your day and I'll talk soon.